Uh, thank you, Evgenia. Um, that's um, very kind. I'm just going to. I'm not sure why. I'm hearing a, an echo. Oh, it's gone. Good. Thank you. Um, it's most disconcerting not being able to see the audience, but never mind. I should plow ahead. Um, I'm on two screens, so um, if you see me turning away, it's because I'm actually reading from my um, from, from my script on, on another screen. And first, um, I must apologise um, to those who were looking forward to a talk from me on Daughters of the Clithia. Um, it's a subject on which there's much to say. But as I begin to prepare that talk, as I began to prepare that talk, I also began to realise that this is not the right time. And I felt more and more that I wanted to say some things on brotherhood, because real brotherhood is something that often eludes us as members of the theosophical movement. There have been too many quarrels and splits over the years, and it seems to me that we need to find a way to address them and to heal them, and at least to look together, whether we can agree or not. This isn't a fixed talk. It is like many talks still evolving. I'm going to quote well-known theosophists past and present. And I'm going to use some artworks to illustrate some of the points we're talking about. Because great art and its symbols teach us about the great lessons of life, the great spiritual truths, and about the human condition and the psyche and the soul. And because this is a talk about brotherhood, I was led to what art can teach us about relatedness, that is, about the divine and brotherhood, by which I mean our oneness, in which we are all one, and our relatedness, each of us with our own self, and also wider relatedness, each of us, to each other and to the whole. So I'm showing, as the title slide, slide the mystic nativity by the Italian Renaissance artist, Sandro Botticelli. Oh, my slide isn't moving on, I'm not quite sure why. Um, uh, try clicking on it, it's not moving. Try, um, I, yeah, here we go. next, yes. Okay, um, thanks Erica. Um, we saw uh, Botticelli's work, many, many of us saw it at the European School in Florence a couple of years ago when the school was in Tuscany. This painting, though, is in the National Gallery in London in England. Note that it's called the mystic nativity. The mysticism, the mystic aspect of this painting, has been much written about by art historians. Looking at it, we all sense that there is meaning here, and we want to look more deeply to reveal that meaning. I love this painting and usually visit it when I'm in the gallery. And I went to see it again last week when the gallery reopened after lockdown. It was wonderful to be there and to see it. I was thinking about this talk and looking for inspiration from the art. What came to me, and so what I hope we can notice here is relatedness. Look carefully at the figures and I'm just going to use my um, microphone, uh, sorry, my, um, I'm just going to make it slightly bigger. Um, look carefully at the figures. They're all engaged in acts of relatedness, acts of care for the other. Look at the care and tenderness with which the angels embrace each other and the human figures. The description on the National Gallery website says the following. The infant Christ reaches up towards the Virgin Mary, oblivious of his visitors, the three kings on the left and the shepherds on the right. The golden dome of heaven has opened up and is circled by 12 angels holding olive branches, note that olive branches, entwined with scrolls and hung with crowns. In the foreground, three pairs of angels and men embrace. Among their feet, demons scuffle for shelter in the underworld through cracks in the rocks. The Greek, Greek inscription mentions the troubles of Italy, a reference to the invasion of the French who took Naples in 1494 and Milan in 1499, and to the civil strife in Florence itself. 
Botticelli associated these events with the turmoil mentioned in the biblical book of Revelation, which talks about the end of the world and Christ's second coming. The period of upheaval it described would end upon Christ's return, when the devil will be buried, as in this picture. We could continue to look at the imagery, symbolism, and sacred number in this painting. The 12 angels with olive branches, the peace. The four sets of three below. That's one, three, three, four. Angels, kings, shepherds, perhaps every man. The tenderness of all, even the animals, the greenery and the forest behind the stable. Above all, the background of war and strife, about which we're told in the scroll, but in this picture, we're shown only the caring and compassion and relatedness of every creature to the other. As we know, theosophy teaches that we are all part of the one, the absolute. In Madame Lubatsky's secret doctrine, the first and third of the three, um, three fundamental propositions state that there is only the one, the absolute. That we are all part of that one, and that each individual soul is part of the over soul. Each of us like the drops of water. Each of us like the drops of water which make up the ocean or the pebbles which we encounter on the beach. The first object of the Theosophical Society is to form a universal brotherhood open to all without any distinction. The purpose of this brotherhood is, to, is the study of religion, philosophy and science, which is expressed in the second object, and the powers latent in man and nature, which, is, which are expressed in the third object. That is to say, we are in this society, in this movement, to study the spiritual and the occult, ageless wisdom, which is all around us, and which is part of everything, and which we call the absolute whether this everything is perceived or is hidden and is part of the occult world. When the TS began, the idea of a society was just that. It was formed to create a brotherhood, a society of people to research and teach occult truths. Henry Steele Olcott says in Old Diary Lees, Volume 1, on the evening of September the 7th, Mr. Felt gave his lecture on the lost canon of proportion of the Egyptians. An animated discussion followed. In the course of this, the idea occurred to me that it would be a good thing to form a society to pursue and promote such occult research. And after turning it over in my mind, I wrote on a scrap of paper the following. Would it not be a good thing to form a society for this kind of study? And gave it to Mr. Judge, at the moment standing between me and HPB, sitting opposite, to pass over to her. She read it and nodded assent. Thereupon I rose and, with some preparatory remarks, broached the subject. It was unanimously agreed that society should be formed. Like all profound truths, these occult teachings are not just verbal, not just communicated in words, but in everything around us. This is why the arts are so important, because so much creative art is of the spiritual and springs from the divine. As seekers, we try to live in divine wisdom, seeking knowledge and wisdom about the divine, about the gods and about nature. Those of us here at this talk most likely do all do a lot of thinking, feeling and intuiting about what we see or study, every day turning our spiritual thoughts over in our minds as we go about our day. So when I go on my travels, 
I seek out places of interest, which I hope will help me in my theosophical quest to live in the spirit of the divine. And perhaps we might agree that the study of spiritual art is part of the purpose of the theosophical brotherhood so that we can better understand ourselves, the oneness of everything and the absolute. Spiritual and mystical lessons are all around us in art, in architecture, in history, and in nature. Let us form a brotherhood here for the next hour or so to study these truths. This talk began sometime in February 2018, when I was about to take a short trip to Riga in Latvia to look at its art, architectural landscape and history. Events and matters of conflict at the Theosophical Society in England at that time, which I was turning over in my mind during that trip, led me both deliberately, but also perhaps unconsciously to explore the idea, the meaning of brotherhood. When the pupil is ready, the teacher appears. So the exploration of brotherhood and brotherhoods begins with the brotherhoods of Riga, which date from medieval times and which synchronistically presented themselves to me at the very start of my trip. But first, let us set the scene and try to describe the kinds of brotherhoods that might be found in Europe and therefore in Riga in the Middle Ages and even in the present time. Medieval states and cities in the Christian world were dependent for their civic organization, culture, and ability to function on their hierarchies, their tribes, and their brotherhoods. The first brotherhoods were found in the Catholic Church, which had its hierarchies of clerics, who were often deeply involved in politics and who advised and sanctified the rulers, the emperors, kings, and the dukes, and sometimes the empresses, queens, and duchesses, who were nominally at the top of the hierarchy. My slides, I can't see, unfortunately, I can't see my, um, my presenter view, so I'm, I'm not quite sure. The slide wasn't supposed to be next, but anyway, let's know. Okay. We can see a slide now with uh, Buddhist monks. Now we can see the, the author piece. Part of the author piece, yes, right, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I can see I can see what you see actually, but I can't see I can't see the slide in, in, in front unfortunately. Anyway, um, if the slides get slightly out of order, we'll just have to go back and um, and uh, and find them. So um, I'm showing you here part of the Ghent altarpiece by the brothers Jan and Hubert van Eyck, partly because they were brothers and they worked together on the altarpiece, um, but also because it, it's a it's a wonderful. Um, a mystic view of uh, Christianity in the 15th century. Um, it's placed in St. Barbara's Cathedral in Ghent in Belgium, um, and it's placed there in 1432, and we know that because there's actually a, a, an inscription um, which says so. And this also piece is, is in great um, contrast to much of the corruption um, that was prevalent in those societies. But I, I, just, I just wanted to show it because it, it, it gives an idea of, of the costume of the time and it shows the societies very well. And frankly, it's so beautiful that I just wanted to show it. Um, the church too became a hierarchy, more and more so as the Christian church moved through the centuries from its beginning as homely gatherings, mostly women in small home churches to its most powerful presence which in the 13th century. It was this church dominated by corruption, not shown here, hierarchy and rigidity with which HPB took issue in all her writings. It was not the early church. So I'm just going to show you the contrast. Um, this, is a, this is an early church. I'm, I'm so showing you the uh, Basilica of Santa Polinare in Casse in Ravenna from the mid sixth century AD to picture the early church. And I think it's, a, it's a, another wonderful example of relatedness. Um, as you see, Christ the shepherd stands in the middle and the 12 apostles are all around him portrayed as sheep. And there's a bejeweled cross. And so that there's, no, um, there's no image of crucifixion. This, this is a, a very different kind of cross. Um, 
And then back to one of my notes. Sorry about some about yes. And in the Middle Ages, alongside the clerics, there were the monasteries with brotherhoods of monks and sisterhoods of nuns, whose sole purpose was to lead the spiritual life, perhaps the theosophical life of devotion, goodness, and service. And I've actually cho chosen here um, <coughs> some Hindu nuns who are actually in Hawaii, and I've chosen them because I thought they looked very jolly. And um, most of them don't look don't look terribly Indian, but um, but they are very jolly. Um, After the monasteries, there was the court of the ruler. And after that came the trade guilds, and they're somewhat similar in, in the way that they function. These are brotherhoods of the material world and of action in the community. In Central Europe, for example, in, in Riga, as in all the Baltic states, and in Prague and in the Czech Republic, the brotherhoods of Freemasonry were very strong. And there are remarkably large numbers of signs and symbols of Freemasonry all over Riga built into the bricks of its buildings and on display in its art galleries and museums. <clears throat> Once we know where to look, we can see them everywhere, including in portraits, often 18th and 19th century portraits of the prominent middle classes. Through this, we can understand the importance to the merchants and officials of Riga of this brotherhood culture, which allowed these brotherhoods to build prosperous lives and cities. In the Middle Ages, the same classes and professionals also form trade guilds. And here in England, these trade guilds are still to be found today in the city of London. And I can't see my audience really, but um, I'm sure that many of you, particularly if you're in Europe, will also have experience of, um, of trade guilds. And it'd be quite interesting to talk about that. Um, so hopefully I'm gonna be able to show you. Yeah, here's, here's um, Riga up here in Latvia. And we stepped out in our first day in Riga and immediately encountered the house of the Brotherhood of Blackheads. Which is a famous landmark in the city. The original building dated from the 14th century. Um, it began as a Brotherhood of unmarried German merchants in Riga. Their patron was St. Morris, an Egyptian military leader and a Coptic Christian, and I showed you a picture of this now, um, who had, he headed the Theban Legion of Rome in the third century AD. He was black, hence the black sculpted heads which decorate the building alongside decorative interior artwork from Morris and Company, the company set up by the English designers, William Morris and, Bur and Edward Burne Jones. Uh, this, this, the fact that it was decorated by Morrison Company was probably because the building was refurbished so many times. And if you look on the, oops, on the slide before, you'll see it was refurbished in 1886. So um, it's very possible that that's when it acquired what I'm just about to show you. Yeah, so the interior, much of the interior decoration, uh, uh, decorative artwork is from Morris and Company, the company set up by the English designers William Morris and Edward Burne Jones. This depicted King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which is a legend found not just in Britain, but throughout Europe in the Middle Ages. In these guilds and masonry brotherhoods, the brother masons held amongst them, the whole being greater than the sum of, the, of, the, of each individual. They held the occult secrets of the celestial great architect, and they built together as an expression of brotherhood in action in the service of the divine plan. The flowering of the brotherhood is expressed in their works of art, the great churches and cathedrals. The same divine impetus of spiritual brotherhood in action can be seen in the great temples and mosques in Asia, Australasia, Egypt, South America, and everywhere else. And that's a close-up of the tapestry that you, you see behind the night you've just seen. 
that tapestry is found in quite a lot of um, places in England too, but it's it's also in this in the house of the um, Black Brotherhood of the Black Kids in um, in Riga. The Knights of the Round Table were the forerunners of many brotherhoods whose business was warfare and conflict to gain territory, at least as, and at least ostensibly to, to defend and, and protect spiritual sanctuaries. Many of these are divine brotherhoods, such as the Knights Templar, who are well known, and not just because of Dan Brown's book. They're well known for their divine secrets and their protection of the Grail and the Holy Blood. It's no coincidence that many of the most atmospheric of the churches of Europe, such as the Chapel of the Holy Blood in Bruges in Belgium, and the Temple Church, the Church of the Knights Templar at the gates of the City of London, for example, are the churches or chapels of the Holy Blood. When we walk into a holy space dedicated to the Knights of the Medieval Brotherhoods, we can feel a very strong atmosphere, heavy with sacredness, a feel of battles past, both public and personal, and of redemption, redemptions brought about by inner work, both individual and in the brotherhoods, all underscored by the symbolism found in the architecture of the buildings and of the landscape which surrounds them. The brotherhood found in the military is worthy of study, including study from within. Platoons are often known as the bands of brothers. And in wartime, being under attack or shared calamity or disaster is especially fruitful in bringing communities together to tackle common problems. <clears throat> by the way, we're looking at um, one of a series of tapestries by um, Edward Byrne Jones, the artist Edward Byrne Jones for Morrison Company, um, depicting uh, the, the a quest for the Holy Grail. And this is these are the, the knights leaving on the quest um, for the Grail. However, <clears throat> the so-called peace after any conflict has too often been settled by division of land and place and community. All tribes needed to find home but it must not be at the expense of the other. Divide to try to end conflict or prevent further ones was often a 20th century political solution. But we should leave it behind in the 21st century now, that the now that the world is even smaller and more interconnected than ever. This is the age of the World Wide Web, but also of pandemics and climate change. We all depend on each other, and more, and more than, than that, we must find ways to live together with care for each other in proper relatedness. Man-made division, racial, but especially religious division, is never the solution. We all have to learn to live together and to get along, and more than that, actively to relate to each other. Good leaders know this and try to broker a peace in good relatedness. However hard they, they may appear, however hard that that peace may they appear to, to, to achieve. The culture of any organization is often set by its leaders, but we're all leaders of our own beings and our own relatedness. It's up to each of us to strive for integrity so that we are not divided within ourselves and do not bring that division with us into the brotherhood. Unfortunately, we can encourage conflict if we try to, to suppress it as a mistake. We start again. Unfortunately, we can encourage conflict if we try to suppress it as a mistaken tactic to appear strong. In psychoanalysis, Freud and others established that what is, is suppressed and not dealt with, or what is cast out, will continue to surface until it is taken out and examined, and if harmful, it is rendered harmless. And every time it comes back, fiercer than before, just like the heads of the monster which Hercules had to cut off until it, it is heard and met appropriately and integrated within the whole. Conversely, the strong leader is not afraid to be open, is not threatened by the brilliance of others, which he encourages, 
nor afraid to let others dare to win. We all must aspire to be strong leaders of our own lower selves. A strong leader shows strength through reconciliation and bringing communities together. He is open and tolerant of different, tolerant of difference and non-violent dissent. And he increases his influence and territory, taking everyone with him by compassion and wisdom, not through diktats, secrets, bullying and force. He is one who can form and maintain a great team which commits wholly to teamwork while, re while relishing difference. He makes sure each of his brothers is also strong, as together the whole is stronger. He makes it clear to everyone what is expected of everyone so that everyone knows what they are doing and what others will be doing. There are clear, modern and regularly updated strategies and plans covering every piece of the operation. A strong leader is always slightly ahead of and on top of the game. He rallies the brotherhood effortlessly. A strong leader is actively grateful and actively sh and shows each member of the team that she is valued. He is just and seems to be just. He does not have favorites, is not secretive, but is transparent and clear. He is compassionate and generous and leads not by auteur, but by clear, open and collegiate example. He never needs to insist on his point of view as the plan, whatever plan is decided on, is naturally perceived and willingly adopted by our brotherhood. There is not much blame or punishment or division around our team, as everyone is committed to helpful and kind behavior towards every other. In the strong leaders team, everyone leads in his own subtle aura because everyone is a spark of the leadership ideal, just as in the third fundamental proposition of the secret doctrine, each individual soul is one with the over soul. But what of the Theosophical Society in all this? From the beginning of the Theosophical Society and Movement, as all members probably know, TS members were in conflict with each other. Madeleine Blavatsky fell out early on with the spiritualist and fellow founder member, Emma Harding Britton. <clears throat> Later, HPB's servants, the Coloms, turned against her and tarnished her reputation by accusations that led to the famous 1885 report by the Society for Psychical Research. This was finally reinvestigated and overturned only as late as 1985, a hundred years later, with impetus from the TS's TS own Leslie Price, then editor of Theosophical History, the magazine he founded and which is still being published. The TS in England was dogged by conflict from the outset, from the problems of the 1880s at the London Lodge involving Anna Kingsford and A.P. Sinnott. Later, international conflicts followed, with Annie Besant falling out with another of HPP's fellow founders, William Prime Judge, then leaving the American section. Later still, there were disputes and disagreements between Annie Besant with, among other prominent members, GRS Mead, who had been HPP's secretary, and who had corresponded influentially with the psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung. The TS also parted company with the secretary of the German section of the TS, Rudolf Steiner, who went on to form the Anthroposophical Society. Both of them left the Theosophical Society because of the, the Leadbeater affair and the movement to promote Krishnamurti as a new world teacher, which became known as the Order of the Star and Used. This reached a crisis in 1929 when Krishnamurti renounced the order and many members left the TS. Several contemporary TS teachers have commented on the problem that the TS espouses brotherhood, but that its members often struggle to achieve it within many of its own lodges and sections. This will not do, and we must work actively to make changes and bring us all back to right relationship with each other, with all beings, 
and without exclusion. All of these are periods in theosophical history which deserve much more of our positive attention as members of the theosophical movement, especially because of the spiritual lessons which the conflicts and mistakes and their resolution can teach us about enacting real brotherhood. Since those early fragmentations, further splits occurred. And since the founding of the TS, other theosophical movements have been formed, most notably the United Lodge of Theosophists with, with William Wang Judge and the TS Point Loma, now with its HQ in The Hague in Holland. Some years ago, members of these three movements joined together to form international theosophy conferences, which has held It, which has held an annual conference in order to study theosophical teachings and bring everyone together. Yeah, cool. and bring everyone together in brotherhood. Last year and this, the conference has been and will be held online in late July and in early August. An entry is by a modest donation. You can find details easily on the search engine. Similarly, the European School of Theosophy has also brought members of all the different organizations together to meet and to study together. This is a great step forward and pretty much how it should be, but there is still much work to do. There's a great picture of Erica. And there are great opportunities for the Theosophical Movement in bringing about brotherhood in today's world, if only we would take them up. Let us go deeper into Theosophical teachings and hear what teachers past and present have to say. Let us begin with the Golden Stairs, which is a writing taken from the letter of a master that H.P. Blavatsky published. It was first presented in 1888 as a private document to members of the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society, as a guide to chaleship. The text was made public for all to read in 1890. This is the full version on screen. The first part is about our relation to each to ourselves. The second is about our relations to others. So I'm going to read the second part. Behold, the truth before you, a brotherliness for one's co-disciple, a readiness to give and receive advice and instruction, a loyal sense of duty to the teacher, a willing obedience to the behest of truth, once we have placed our confidence in and believe that teacher to be in possession of it, a courageous endurance of personal injustice, a brave declaration of principles, a valiant defense of those who are unjustly attacked and a constant eye to the ideal of human progression and perfection, which the secret science depicts. These are the golden stairs, up the steps of which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. The turning now to look more closely at what later writers have said about brotherhood. And it's important to be honest about our shortcomings. We begin with a very long quote from Edward Abdul, who all of us at the European School know as a prominent contemporary TS member from the United States. Here is Ed writing in Quest magazine in September to October 2008 on the Universal Brotherhood of Humanity. Ed says, the teachers of H.P. Blavatsky, known as adepts, mahatmas, or masters, emphasize brotherhood more than once in their letters. In letter 12 of the Mahatma letters, chronological edition, Kutumi wrote, the chiefs want a brotherhood of humanity, a real universal fraternity started an institution which would make itself known throughout the world and arrest the attention of the higher minds. Yet, says Ed, 
despite the emphasis on universal brotherhood, theosophists have fought amongst themselves from the days of HPV every bit as much as other religious groups have fought amongst themselves since the days of their founders. Perhaps the problem lies in the definition of brotherhood. To many, brotherhood means that we should be tolerant of one another, that we should be nice to one another, that we should not say anything negative about one another. Yet, in the Mahatma letters and HPB's writings, we find sharp criticism of members and non-members, warnings about the motives of certain individuals and the danger they pose to society, and even biting irony to deflate a personal ego. In reading the letters, one quickly learns that no matter how much the adepts may have approved of tolerance and civility, universal brotherhood meant something far more profound to them. Perhaps the following statements from the letters will help us discover what they meant. In chronological letter five, KH wrote, the term universal brotherhood is no idle phrase. Humanity in the mass has a paramount claim upon us. It is the only secure foundation for universal morality and it is the aspiration of the true addict. And in chronological letter 33, he wrote, it is he alone who has the love of humanity at heart, who is capable of grasping thoroughly the idea of, of a regenerating practical brotherhood, who is entitled to the possession of our secrets. He alone will never misuse his powers as there will be no fear that he should turn them to selfish ends. A man who places not the good of mankind above his own good is not worthy of becoming our chela. He is not worthy of becoming higher in knowledge than his neighbor. In this passage, the adept is telling us that the love of humanity can open our eyes, says it, to the fact that all individuals are rooted in the one. Simply believing in universal brotherhood is not sufficient. Ultimately, the belief must give way to become an insight into its truth. When that happens, we sense the unity of all life. And from then on, we are passionately de dedicated to awakening that awareness in others. The current first object of the Theosophical Society is, is to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity. But what does the universal brotherhood of humanity mean? Ed continues. Let's go back to the objectives of 1879. In part, they read, to keep alive in man his spiritual intuitions. In that phrase, there may be a clue to the universal brotherhood to which the adept refers. Intuition, in the theosophical sense, means insight, and insight comes from a unifying aspect of the inner self of every human being, Buddhi. By effort, meditation, and an altruistic way of life, we are capable of becoming one with that aspect of the inner self from which all insights derive. From that, in deep meditation, we can get a sense of what the adept calls humanity as a whole. When we do, even for a fleeting forever, we have become one with the universal brotherhood of humanity. The Theosophical Society was organized to form a nucleus of people who had some sense of the universal brotherhood of humanity, a nucleus of people who sense that the divine consciousness in them is identical to the divine consciousness in all others. The Theosophical Society was meant to be an organization of people from every culture who have some sense of the underlying unity of all. It was meant to be an organization of people who work together to help others realize their underlying unity with humanity as a whole. Far as we may be from it, that is our ultimate goal. Why is it so difficult to achieve? In chronological letter 131, the adept warns us, beware then of an uncharitable spirit, for it will rise up like a hungry wolf in your path and devour the better qualities of your nature broaden instead of narrowing your sympathies. 
try to identify yourself with your fellows rather than to contract your circle of affinity. Friend, beware of pride and egoism, two of the worst snares for the feet of him who aspires to climb the higher paths of knowledge and spirituality. The Theosophical Society is open to all who are in sympathy with its objects. We are meant to see beyond the appearance of not only race, creed and sex, but to see beyond the irritating thoughts of the people we meet, especially members of the TS. Universal brotherhood has no meaning if we only feel brotherly towards those whom we like. This is not to say that we should be sentimental and pretend that everyone is a nice person. Some people and some members are not nice. Yet behind the surface, irrit sorry, yet behind the surface irritants and thoughts lies the divine spark with which all are united. This is not to say we should be blind to the thoughts of others. That would be reading something into brotherhood that is not there. Brotherhood is not even personal affection for everyone. That is impossible, even for some, if not all of the adepts. Yet, in spite of the faults we see in others, and in spite of the fact that some people try our patience, we can still see the divine life within them, and we can still work with them for the greater good. From an awareness of underlying unity comes an altruistic way of life that is compassionate, wise, and practical. That is the sacred mission of the Theosophical Society, made clear by Cage when he wrote, the chief object of the TS is not so much to gratify individual aspirations as to serve our fellow men. If we aspire to a realization of the one, then we can change ourselves in such a way that we can get insight. We can lay aside our own preconceived ideas about people and see beyond appearances to the divine life that is deep within them as it is deep within us. Simply joining the Theosophical Society will not bring this about. We must have an iron, never failing determination to bring it about in ourselves. And here is Vic Ho Chin writing on HPB's work on the website Theosophy Forward. <clears throat> The message here seems to be that the concept of universal brotherhood rests upon the idea of the one life. The fact that all humanity shares a common life. In an interview with Charles Johnston, Helena Pibovatsky stated that universal brotherhood rests upon the common soul. It is because there is one soul common to all men that brotherhood or even common understanding is possible. Bring men to rest on that, and they will be safe. There is a divine power in every man which is to rule his life, and which no one can influence for evil, not even the greatest magician. Let men bring their lives under its guidance, and they have nothing to fear from man or devil. She also characterized this essential brotherhood as a kinship, which exists on the plane of the higher self, not on the outer personal or physical self. She believed that if this view of kinship were universally accepted, most social evils and international conflicts would disappear. How is this to be carried out in practical life? It continues. HPB Blavatsky states that the Mahatmas had laid down certain guidelines for the practical working of the ideal of universal brotherhood in the following words. He who does not practice altruism, he who is not prepared to share his last morsel with a brother weaker or poorer than himself, he who neglects to help his brother man of whatever race, nation or creed, whenever and wherever he meets suffering and who turns a deaf ear to the cry of human misery, he who hears an innocent person slandered whether a brother theosophist or not, and does not undertake his defense as he would undertake his own, is no theosophist. 
the message here seems to be that to live a theosophical life, we must cherish and help our brothers on the path, not just in the ways in, in which are not just in ways which are obvious, but in the comfort of the inner life. But attacks are still happening, both in private and publicly. A few years ago, the position and motivation of some leading members of some theosophical organizations were attacked, trolled almost, by an unnamed writer on a website which dealt with Blavatsky's teachings. The attack is still out there on the internet. I have met those brother theosophists who were attacked on several occasions. I've met them in Europe and elsewhere. I know that they were very hurt by what was written about them. And I also know from my own investigations and from meeting them and interacting with them, that is from being in relation with them, that they did not deserve the attack in any way whatsoever. And my feeling, and that of many others, is that they are all good and well-intentioned people with right motivation for their actions. As true theosophists, we must do as we are asked and defend them actively in microcosm whenever the slander arises. But as good theosophists, we must have regard to right relatedness in microcosm. And without ignoring or condoning the hurt he has inflicted, the writer has inflicted, we must show our compassion and care to the attacker for the terrible inferno of hell which surrounds him and which brought him to make that attack. Because we cannot be almost certain that the anonymous writer, meanwhile, is a troubled soul who does not know right relationship and who therefore deserves our compassion so that we collectively may comfort him and he may be brought back to right relationship in true brotherhood. Outwardly, however, what more might the TS and our members do to fulfill the first object and encourage brotherhood? And how does this tie in with conflict, the theme of this, the theme we have here? Perhaps as the poet Rumi says in the house guest, it is by encouraging the misfortunes of others to come to us to be healed. I'm going to cut a bit because I can see that time is passing on. I mean, I'm not, I'm just going to carry on, that's why we do. Um, conflict, it seems to me, almost always arises from a sense of lack or loss. This gives rise to greed in the case of lack, for position or possession. In the case of loss, which affects us all and many times in our lives, conflict and anger can arise as a result of, of a failure to heal wounding and hurt and of failure to address these losses and to grieve and mourn loss. If our basic human needs are not met, then trauma results. This is often taken to mean Maslow's hierarchy of food, shelter and other material needs. But just as important are, are our emotional and spiritual needs, including valuing others, which means gratitude and meeting loss. If, according to the African tribal saying, it takes a whole village to raise a child, then it takes a whole community, a whole brotherhood to mourn a loss. This collective grieving and mourning is vital if that loss is going to be healed. And along with grief and hurt to be healed, there are three more positive G words to explore and practice in relatedness. These are gratitude, generosity, and grace. I was alerted to gratitude by Rupert Sheldrake, who in recent years has published two unusual books for him about spiritual practices. In the first book, one of the practices is gratitude. Rupert is an honorary life member of the TS and gave a talk to launch the book. I asked him about gratitude and he said the opposite of gratitude is self entitlement Suddenly in the last couple of years, gratitude as a spiritual practice seems to be everywhere. Cicero thought that the most important of the virtues is gratitude. But in the Theosophical Society, I'm not sure that we practice it enough. 
We talk a lot about karma and reincarnation, but how might we practice gratitude towards our aggressors and how do we relate to them? Do we talk enough about how we look after the world and each other positively, how we relate to each other? Gratitude, generosity, and grace are virtues well known in nature as each element relies on another to create the whole. It's no coincidence that the tree of life is featured so symbolically in the esoteric mysteries of life. As we know from myth, fairy tales, and folklore, the forest is the place where seekers, those who are esoterically ready, whether they are aware of this or not, go to receive lessons in the spiritual arts, both directly and indirectly. In his book, The Hidden Life of Trees, Peter Bolleben makes the case that the forest is a social network. He draws on scientific discoveries to describe how trees are like human families. Three parents live together with their children, communicate with them, support them as they grow, share nutrients with those who are sick or struggling, and even warn each other of impending dangers. In other words, they are living brotherhoods, brotherhoods with much to teach us human beings. More recently, Rupert's son, Merlin Sheldrake, has written similarly about the interconnectedness of fungi, a bestseller. Nature is all around us as our teacher. In 2018, during Midsummer Week on BBC Radio 3, programmes came from and were about the forest. One person who featured all week was the artist David Nash, who sculpts abstract works in wood often wood which has been left to weather. And you're seeing one of his installations here. When I was studying at the Victoria and Albert Museum, some fellow students were talking about David Nash. Several of them had volunteered to help with one of his art installations. What impressed them most, apart from the artworks themselves, and they spoke very enthusiastically about those, was that David had thanked every volunteer by sending each one of them a piece of wood from the same work. The wood was reclaimed and had weathered over time. In doing this, David, and all of them by giving and receiving to the project, created a brotherhood of volunteers, all of whom were bound together. By the time the wood had spent weathering, by the wood itself, and by the time they spent volunteering, and by working together on this one shared project. And finally, by this Manvantara, if I can call it that, this piece of periodicity wherein the creative work of brotherhood came to fruition, acknowledged by these wooden gifts of gratitude. We have to find ways of working together with this weathering of the wood these old wounds of the past, working together as brothers to heal them collectively and openly rather than suppressing them. The ancient Greeks understood this in the catharsis of their dramatic tragedies, which were not just plays, but were part of their religious and ritual lives. In the play by Sophocles, Oedipus and the Oedipus the King, start again. In the play by Sophocles, Oedipus the King goes to consult the Delphic Oracle to find a way for his city to escape the plague. And when the truth of his unwitting immature actions is spoken by the Pythia, both his life and his kingship unravel in order that Dharma or right order can be restored to the kingdom and the plague that threatens it can be conquered. We are all actors in this ancient Greek drama which unfolds before us, all witnesses, and all of us are also Oedipus, the king. There on the stage, the wounds, griefs and hurts of each one of us are portrayed by the hero or the heroine. And we all partake in his or her suffering and we hope his eventual healing and redemption. Anyone who has ever attended these plays or seen a performance of a tragedy by William Shakespeare or any of the great master dramatists of the world great theatrical pieces, and some with music, including Wagner's tremendous ring cycle, 
Anyone who has witnessed and been part of these rituals as audience will know this feeling of catharsis when it finally arrives at resolution. And it's worth remembering that Greek drama began as religious ritual with the aim of binding the audience, the tribe and the brotherhood together, despite all individual quarrels and difficulties. It is in the shared catharsis of truth and reconciliation that brotherhoods are healed. In this union, this brotherly coming together and feeling and restoration of <coughs> right order in the collective psyche. We know, even for a moment, the embodiment of the self-realization that is now the stated mission of the agile theosophical society, both individually and collectively in brotherhood. The message is about right relationship and active ways of healing. So let us end with quotes from Dora Kuntz. Dora came from a theosophical family, which is still active in the TS today. Dora was a past president of the Theosophical Society in America and a devoted student of the Mahatma Letters. In 1955, she gave a talk on the Masters. What she had to say has much to do with the kind of brotherhood meant by the Masters, and the following is from a transcript of her talk. There are thousands of members of the Theosophical Society, but there are very few Theosophists. It's very easy to sign a piece of paper and say you want to join the Theosophical Society and that you believe in brotherhood. But brotherhood is something we should live instead of talking about. The Theosophical Society is the testing ground for brotherhood. It is the place to let ourselves grow, to let ourselves understand that we are not to be dogmatic, to let ourselves learn to get along with one another, whether we like one another or not. You must be willing to have differences of opinion. You must be willing to stand the acid test, even if you are called names. It is you who are being tested. If you walk out because one individual says something nasty to you, you are failing the test of brotherhood. If you could think of the personalities that you meet as an acid test of your own character, of your own philosophy, you would get a different point of view. When something comes up, Ask yourself how you will take it and ask yourself what it is about you that needs to be changed. The tests are not easy. They require us to stand firm on the principle of brotherhood, despite subtle or direct attacks on us. Personal injustice is never easy to bear, but nothing truly worthwhile is ever easy. Blavatsky tells us, in her last work, the paradox that we named the voice of the silence, that there is a road, steep and thorny, beset with perils of every kind, yet still a road, and it leads to the very heart of the universe. Dora continues, the thorns, those wood images again. The thorns and perils come as personal injustice and the arduous tasks required in the self-transformation process. There at the heart of the universe, the heart of the universe, the same phrase that HPB uses. And I would say, as Janet would say, at the heart of the first object, the object of universal brotherhood, through the manifestation of the second and third objects. Dora now continues, there at the heart of the universe is the ultimate unity of all. Those in the Theosophical Society who even dimly sense that unity are forming a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity. Those who sense it work passionately to help their neighbors to sense it. And that I put before you is our mission as members of the Theosophical Society and members of the Theosophical Movement to find that brotherhood, even when, especially when it seems that separation is the only viable and harmonious course. It is not. Theosophia, divine wisdom, is found in relatedness, relatedness within ourselves and, of course, with the other. 
in kindness, in a willingness to meet and embrace the other in true brotherhood. Rather than continue to be at war with each other, can we not come together and talk to each other directly and openly about our wounds and our hurts until we can agree on a peace? Even if it takes many days to reach that peace, and we need to give ground and face up to our many personal shortcomings and mistakes so that we each may purge them and restore true, open and honest harmony for us all. For the attainment of true healing for all through right relatedness is the deepest form of real brotherhood, even if the most apparently elusive. We must not give up this sacred duty. We must make positive and generous effort and try harder. Finally, I want to thank Erica and the European School for inviting me to speak here and to thank you, the audience, for forming a nucleus of this brotherhood of humanity, this unity, here on Zoom.